comment that Kraftwerk are more influential, more important, more beautiful than the Beatles could ever be is, is becoming less and less odd and more and more exactly what we always thought it would be, the truth. <laughs> In the late 60s and early 70s, when Kraftwerk was striving to find a new artistic voice in the pop cultural vacuum of post-war Germany, few would have predicted that these reclusive Rhineland experimentalists would become one of the most influential pop groups of all time. But that is exactly what happened. Painting on a refreshingly blank canvas, they created emotional electronic music that fused commercial pop with the avant-garde, an industrial folk music with global appeal that predicted what music would sound like and the world would look like in the digital age. Unsere Generation, wir mussten halt wieder von vorne starten und da wir irgendwie in dieser rein Ruhe Situation leben, ist die Musik eben statt statt von ländlichen Sachen mehr von Stadt und Maschinen beeinflusst und spiegelt diese Sachen wieder. Kraftwerk's influence has grown with every passing year, and now, 45 years later, they've been embraced by the art world, their Gesamtkunstwerk celebrated in elaborate 3D concert seasons at iconic art spaces in New York, Dusseldorf, London, Sydney and Tokyo. The most apt of these events took place in the former power station at London's Tate Modern. Eight nights sold out in minutes, with ticket demand crashing the servers and the public in critical hysteria confirming their status as a work of art. With over 100,000 disappointed fans stuck outside in the cold, our cameras were invited in by the group to capture world-exclusive impressions of their sensational show for this film, Kraftwerk Pop Art. Putting them in a, a gallery or a museum is, is utterly appropriate because they are, in a way, living sculptures. They are an installation. They are an installation that involves a commentary on pop music, a commentary on show business. Uh, but that's not all that it is. What it is mostly is a fascinating comment on reproduction, on, on what happens to a work of art when it, gets, it becomes a, a, a mass-produced mass object. It's got all those elements in it. Just the whole aesthetic completely fits not only the space, the power station, Turbine Hall of Tate Modern, but they've influenced so many visual artists that we've worked with. It's sort of a consecration to actually be 
allowed in the inner sanctum of curated art because it's an admission that what they do is actually timeless enough and representative enough of our culture that it should really merge with, uh, say, visual works for the most part. The next thing that comes into the Tate Modern is Roy Lichtenstein. And that's the world where they belong. They've had that much an impact on cultural thought, on people making art, on musicians making art. They are beyond just playing a, a venue. Mark Camille Shamovitz, an artist who's in our biggest splash exhibition at the moment, has used their music and, and been inspired by them. Mark Lecky, who won the Turner Prize a few years, also cites them as an influence. Michael Clark, the choreographer, who's always worked across disciplines, loves their music. There are many, I mean, so many artists wanted tickets to come and see them here. Craftwork's show actually is a real show, but it doesn't rely on the cliches. And there's something about the standing still that's very fascinating as well as a distillation of performance because the corny movements in rock, the holding of the guitar that way, the thrusting of the groin that way, the shaking of the head and the swirling of the microphone is ultimately ridiculous and monotonous and pointless that I'd rather think, I think, in the end, see the distillation to the stillness with all that going on around them. But it is performance, you know, and it is, it is um, transfixing. That was a really important thing for us, was the visual aspect of what they're doing, which is becoming more and more important for them. And they've put so much work into the visual 3D show as part of this. It took years to make it work properly, to make the robots work, to make all those things work. And technology has come to the point where it can get better and better and better. So it's a show, it's a concept that can continue to develop. I think that's what drives them. I think the fascination of how far they can go with that technology. Craftwork came into being when Ralph Hutter met Florian Schneider on an improvised music course at Dusseldorf Conservatory in 1968. Early incarnations of the band included a live drummer and a guitarist who went on to form Neu. But in the flourishing German music scene of the day, the band with which they had the most in common were classically inspired electro-experimentalists can. The two acts jammed together at an art gallery, and their first official concert together was a free-form televised youth show from a youth club in Uno in 1970, before Kraftwerk had released a single album. We had in 1968 uns ein kleines Studio gebaut und das dauerte gar nicht lange. Da kamen zwei Leute aus Düsseldorf und wollten uns eigentlich besuchen. Das war Ralf und Florian und äh, keiner konnte eigentlich irgendwas Besonderes, sondern man, man stellte sich aufeinander ein und es war ein ganz offenes Musikkonzept, was damals war. Und dann gingen die nach Hause. Und das dauerte gar nicht lange, da kamen die aber wieder. Und das machten sie ein paar Mal. Und dann waren sie plötzlich weg. Und Michael Caroli, unser Gitarrist, der sagte, 
Ich glaube, wir werden von denen noch einmal hören, denn er sagt, der Ralf, der spielt wirklich etwas Substanzielles. Das, was der macht, hat Substanz. Das erkennt man sehr schnell, wenn man miteinander so improvisiert. Fernsehauftritt, den wir damals machten in Una, ja, das hat es auch ganz deutlich gezeigt. Der Kraftwerk war hier auf einer Bühne und wir waren auf einer anderen Bühne. Und da spielten die schon, damals mit dem Schlagzeuger zusammen. Und da merkte man schon irgendwie, dass, man, dass sie sehr darüber nachdachten, was sie spielten. Im Gegensatz zu uns. Wir konnten das zwar auch, aber wir waren doch dem sehr offenen Konzept, waren wir eigentlich fühlten uns ziemlich verpflichtet. The influential British rock press lumped together the many and various German bands of that era under a quirky title that gave no hint of how revered and influential many of them would be in decades to come. There's this whole movement, um, you know, the kraut rock or whatever they used to call it, between Guru Guru, Neuer, Shratampo, Kahn and all that. And I was into all that back in those days. Diese Krautgeschichte war natürlich äh, ein bisschen äh, Spott. It was a very different view of that German music for various reasons. It was given a slightly affectionate, patronizing name, the crowd walk thing. Ich kann verstehen, dass die deutschen Gruppen, die nach England gekommen waren oder wo die Engländer das gehört haben, sie sofort als Krauts irgendwie angesehen haben, weil es war etwas, was also an den an englischen Standard überhaupt nicht rankommen konnte. Auch Kern konnte nicht. Wir, wir waren nach den Maßstäben, die England gesetzt hatte, waren wir eine schlechte Band. Das wollen wir mal klar sehen. Wir machten viel zu viele Fehler, was das betrifft. Aber es konnte, wenn die Maschine einmal anrief, wie die Engländer dann geschrieben haben, wenn diese, wenn diese Teutonen einmal aus der Sitte nicht mehr zu stoppen, die überrollen alles. seem to come out of uh, the interstellar overdrive end of Pink Floyd. They still seemed hippie. They still seemed not what they became. Da wurde so Musik gemacht ohne Maschinen, sondern eigentlich mit ein paar kleinen, mit ein paar kleinen Spielsachen. Es, es, es klang fast ein bisschen nach Spielzeug. We obviously filtered the whole idea of Kraftwerk now through what they've become. But there were a few years where they were not yet that and they were becoming it. They were always becoming. Das ist ja nur später anders geworden und da sind auch Jahre drüber hinweg gegangen dass das Ganze nun plötzlich zu einem regelrechten Konzept geworden war. The first impact with Kraftwerk was, I guess, for me, in a way, seeing the sleeve to Autobahn. Because that was a revelation, in a way, because then they, they distilled lots of things down to just a, um, a, a, a kind of impression of something and, and seemed suddenly very modern.
Kraftwerk finally crystallized conceptually in 1974 on Autobahn, their fourth album. The majestic 22-minute title track, featuring lyrics for the first time, was a disco hit in America, and the sleeve's simple modernist graphics signaled a clear visual identity that Ralph and Florian were developing with art school collaborator Emil Schult. Design guru Neville Brody, now a lecturer at the Royal College of Art in London, was the most influential graphic designer of the 1980s. His role as art director of Style Bible The Face magazine began with his 1982 layout of a craftwork interview. He remembers the impact of their visuals most clearly. Autobahn is an interesting example where the record cover becomes something far more semiotic. It's a sign that's been transposed from one purpose to another. And it's sort of saying that pop music doesn't necessarily have to be self-referential anymore. It can look at other ideas in society. Most of their work on covers re resolved around using themselves as part of their own brand image and, and not taking it too seriously. The cover of Trans Europe Express was a subversive slap in the face of rock chic. In the year of punk, Hollywood black and white glamour photos show the group in pseudo-period settings and poses, while Emil Schultz's affectionately kitschy colour poster has them looking like city gents out for a Sunday lunch in a country restaurant. A Diamante music note brooch on Florian's lapel, the only indication that they are not in fact chartered accountants. They started to build the connection between Dadaism, constructivism, and modern music. The man machine sleeves that Kraftwerk did was very much influenced by the look and feel of Russian constructivism. And it was born out of the idea that the future would be built by engineers and scientists, and that in fact our faith in engineering was what was going to bring us to utopia. So it was a kind of utopian ideal. It was extremely experimental. It was a lot of angles, um, very strong typography, which eventually ended up in a kind of a Bauhaus space, which then influenced everything we do. Constructivism was very engaging, it was very powerful, and the prime influence within constructivism um, was a man called Alexander Rodchenko. And the craft work covers at the early stages very much related to a kind of Rodchenko way of, of uh, looking. So it was a kind of her heroic workers' ethic. Uh, the workers were also going to help build the future. Strong use of red and black, which were, of course, the communist colours. Red and black were also the colours of a lot of fascistic movements within the 20th century. So craft work were playing on that middle ground, to be honest. You know, where does heroics become uh, self-defeating? So something that's democratic becomes dictatorial. the way of thinking that Kraftwerk had within record covers um, was quite radical. Actually led, I think, to a lot of the, certainly the early punk covers and the early new wave covers. Factory records were clearly influenced by this, as was the, the early work of Malcolm Garrett. Um, so you have Autobahn as this very simplistic statement. And Autobahn was, was radical at the time. There was no other record covers like this. Autobahn won Kraftwerk new fans like Rainer Werner Fassbinder and David Bowie, the latter touring Europe in a vintage Mercedes playing Autobahn non-stop and telling everyone that Kraftwerk were his favourite band, an act of patronage that forever changed their status with the rock press. 
David Bowie in the 70s was like your Google search at the time. You know, whatever David Bowie mentioned was therefore where you went. Bowie had sort of altered his trajectory explicitly because of Kraftwerk, and, and that was an incredible... It was almost an advertising campaign for Kraftwerk, if you like, you know, the, the, a commercial endorsement and a, a sense that we now all wanted to find out um, the history of, of this, this incredible group that had influenced the most extraordinary period of David Bowie's life. To leave the daytime free for cycling, Kraftwerk worked night shifts, clocking in at their legendary Dusseldorf Kling Klang studio like workers at a sound factory. The albums they produced there sounded like nobody else, partly because they had challenged technicians to develop new instruments for them, equipment not available to anyone else. Man kann ja nicht in den Laden gehen und diese Sachen einfach sagen, ich will das jetzt. Wir mussten das eben selbst machen alles. Wir basteln immer selbst mit einem anderen Freund, der ist noch Musik Ingenieur oder Toningenieur, der hilft uns und wir bauen dann die ganzen Sachen selbst. And the yearning, romantic beauty of the music they created with that equipment shattered the strongly held misconception of electronic music as emotionally frigid. Ideologically, the wood of the blues and therefore rock was where authenticity lay. And somehow there was still, which is weird, a troubled response to machines. There was somehow soul in, in holding a wooden piece of uh, uh, instrument and, and somehow soullessness in having a machine. But I always felt that, that, that it was almost the opposite and that, that it, it emphasised and framed and illuminated the soul that was in craft work, that tenderness, that real humanity, because they were prepared to deal with machines and use machines to distribute their ideas and information. They were extraordinary geniuses at melody, and it was the melody that, that ultimately carried through the soul. Kraftwerk weren't the first, but we consider them to be the first to understand the potential of, of electronic machines and, uh, and the studio itself and the combination of the two things to really create uh, to popular music. And of course, everything that happened since Kraftwerk has been a con continuation of that. You take, say, their closest rivals in terms of iconic presence, we would say, the Beatles. Well, the Beatles don't really influence them. The Beatles influence Elton John and George Michael and take that and, you know, maybe ELO at a pinch, but they don't really influence anything. It's almost like that was a juddering halt already to an extent. Was Kraftwerk constantly release information? They influenced the avant-garde end, the, the area that, 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 that went way out and, and even all the way up to glitch and it all started to disintegrate and even, you know, the harder, stranger areas of dubstep. But you also hear it in, in Kylie Minogue and, and, and the popular, you know, mainstream. You hear the ghost of Kraftwerk everywhere. And that's, I mean, that's another wonderful element of Kraftwerk. They haunt the imagination. Uh, they haunt the world, you know, as, as the light goes out now and you look out, you kind of see a visual representation of the sound of Kraftwerk. You know, for me, the, the soundtrack that you would use to represent this is, is going to be Kraftwerk. Kraftwerk's nerdy commitment to freshness meant they'd produce some wonderful sounds. Kraftwerk were the, the, the poets of that in a way, exquisite um, novelty in, in what, a, what sound could do and be and how seductive it could be. Kraftwerk's genius in a way was not just giving it the rhythm that then consoled people and they understood that it was um, attractive because there was this wonderful rhythm. But they also applied beautiful melodic sense that, that wasn't just 
an understanding of melody within popular music or rock music, but an understanding of melody that went back centuries. And in that sense, I always felt that they were classical musicians whose genius was to understand that popular music and the way that it used the studio was actually where the new developments were taking place in music. Kraftwerk understood that the studio was, the, you know, it was as important an instrument and an arrival of an instrument as the piano was in Mozart's time. We're not only looking at one of the seminal acts in the history of electronic music, but you could say arguably one of the most powerful inspiring ones, and uh, therefore probably one of the most likely to become um, as legendary as Mozart and Bach. And some of those composers whose work and, you know, music we still revere hundreds of years later. I, I see that now. Undoubtedly, without any reservation. Trans Europe Express, a mighty groove that emerged from a jam session like a train crashing through the studio, saw the percussive hardening of their sound and became a pivotal record in the birth of DJ culture. Trans Europe Express was the only record that Grandmaster Flash would play uninterrupted, and visiting a loft club in New York, Kraftwerk were amazed and pleased to hear the DJ playing an extended loop of metal on metal, exactly as they would in the studio. Soon their unique sounds began to resurface dismembered and out of context all over the place, forming a recurrent theme in every regional black American dance scene from DC Go-Go to Detroit Techno, until eventually these stiff Germans became the most improbably influential white act in the history of dance music. What was fantastic about that is, first of all, all the white music that borrowed so liberally from black music didn't give anything back. Kraftwerk sort of have basically, you know, on behalf of the entire white world, handed back some of the debt that is owed to, you know, black music, you know, giving so much that white music nicked. Rock and roll and, and, and everything that came nicked so much. And it was a, a dreadful form of um, cultural col colonization. And Kraftwerk, in a sort of rather sweet liberal way, have basically given back. Having spent his teen years listening to kraut rock in Strasbourg, Francois Kevorkian moved to New York in the mid-70s, where he got a job drumming alongside DJs in a bar. He went on to become one of the most popular underground DJs in America and one of the busiest remixes of the 1980s, working with everyone from cult dance legends like D-Train and Dinosaur L to chart titans U2 and Depeche Mode. Francois K was the first creative outsider to penetrate Kraftwerk's inner circle, becoming their house mixer. Years earlier, he'd witnessed their extraordinary impact on dance culture firsthand. I think the amazing thing about Kraftwerk is how multicultural they are, how easily all that music translated to black audiences. Like the they just got it like that. Those in New York that started to hear these strange records coming over from Germany in the mid-70s um, probably saw their city and heard their city in this music as, as much as any other music they were listening to. Because it was so beautifully rigid and repetitive, 
it was therefore it was so wonderfully rhythmic. Uh, and, and the idea that you could replace the drummer with the machine, but the machine would give you this in incredible um, insight into the mobility of funk. It was that stiff that was funky. It was like, it was like a linear, you know, like, it was almost like a EKG, you know, for the hospital. It was like, da, then it would bing, then it would bing, 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 bing. And it was like, that shit is cool. It was so clean. It was so exact and so perfect that it had to be funky. You know, to see these dudes, these straight-laced white dudes, you know, wearing these ties and these green shirts and green pants and this whole androgynous look, it was, it was stiff, but it was funky. It was just enough of this in the middle of this to make it work. Tarantula Brick Express was so funky. Oh, oh, you, just like in a big sound system and all that, the, and that metal sounds and all. It was just like bugged out. Like people were like, yo man, I'm tripping, what's this? These crowds grew into Trans Europe Express in the summer of 1977, right next to Barry White and Marvin Gaye and Sasso Orchestra. You know, it, and to these people, to that crowd, no one ever questioned it. I mean, people were like, wow, that's, that thing you're playing, that's weird, man, what's that? But they loved it. And, and I, I think uh, even more so with Computer World, where you know, obviously numbers was just like, when numbers came out, it was like, forget it. I mean, like, wow. Four, two, 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 four, two
Yeah. When we talk about hip-hop, there are different kinds. I mean, obviously, there's the down-tempo part, the real funky beats and all that, but Planet Rock was more like, almost like proto-techno in a way. On his groundbreaking hip-hop hits, Planet Rock, Looking for the Perfect Beat and Renegades of Funk, Africa Bambata fused beats from Trans Europe Express and Numbers so prominently that Kraftwerk ended up receiving royalties. That was obviously something Arthur Baker and John Roby did as a production team. I think that was a bit of a genius move on their part because they um, kind of like took these two very strong elements and made it into something that was just so irresistible. Um, I guess history, you know, validated that particular record as being one that sort of helped start the whole electro movement. The Computer World album and tour saw Kraftwerk entering the 80s on an all-time high that 1986's Electric Cafe album failed to match, which was ironic as the next year their influence was about to explode anew in Detroit of all places. A cadre of Kraftwerk crazy producers known as the Belleville Three, Derek May, Juan Atkins and Kevin Saunderson, were busy perfecting a new world-beating genre that would soon become known as techno. Ralph Hooter and Florence Schneider once. That was in Detroit. That was 15 years ago for sure. It was a huge concert for them. It was almost like a restart of their career. And they were very happy to come there. And they sold out a venue that holds 7,000 people. It was, a, it was an amazing show. It was an amazing moment. It was, the energy was incredible. It wasn't just intellectual heads that were there to hear them play. It was kids. This was incredible for them because they were playing to like fans, people that were just like loving the music and they were screaming and making noise. And this was, I think, a very important show for them. It really sort of uh, sent a chill up the spine of, of all the guys from Kraftwerk to make them realize that they had a second life and Detroit was the place where it started. It wasn't just us, it was the whole, the whole of Detroit, Michigan, the whole of Cleveland, the whole of Chicago. Black people, man, were like locked into this music. You, on regular radio, on daytime radio in America, you could hear Pocket Calculator on the Computer World album. You could hear Pocket Calculator, Janet Jackson, Rick James, and a Prince song, all in, in less than 30 minutes. enjoying the fact that black people were, were down with this music. Even George Clinton was digging it. You know, I mean, come on, man. 
You got the you got the blackest of black men loving this shit in the middle of Detroit, Michigan. This was incredible. They're more than techno music. They are creators of a genre that had no name up until we came along. Up until then it was just it was just amazing electronic music from these guys. And I really wish they were not part of techno music. I really for them I wish that they didn't have to be part of that cuz a lot of techno music is shitty. A lot of the guys making it don't deserve to have their names attached to craft work. Look at the cover to We Are the Robots. They played on this kind of sexuality thing a little bit. They kind of enjoyed it. We Are the Robots was definitely their their sort of uh, stepping out moment as a creative androgynous group. Nobody knew for sure if these guys were gay or straight, and I think they really enjoyed that. We are the robots. Hell yeah. It was so funky without being funky. It was like as if it was wow. It's hard to explain it, you know. I mean, the bass line to computer work, dun 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 dun. You know, that was incredible, man. It's more fun to compute. These songs, man, it was just like, fuck. This shit was on fire. was the album when they knew they could do everything they wanted to do. Everything they dreamed of doing, they finally could do it. And they knew it. That was the album that they could break the, break the wall. And they did it. The compositional aspect of how some of that craft rock music is structured never ceases to amaze me. I think the melodies are very timeless. And a good example of that is obviously <clears throat> the tip of the hat from Coldplay. They were very big fans of the band's melodies and when they did that song it was definitely a tribute a tip of the hat or a way of saying wow we, we love you so much For a band like that, it's probably the uh, ultimate way to show appreciation. Ah. Uh -huh. 
it opened their music up to a whole new age group and audience that might not otherwise really have been uh, aware of them. Being aware of Kraftwerk does not mean, however, that this new generation of fans had it any easier getting tickets to the Tate Modern concerts. With nine out of ten applicants disappointed, young devotees organised a midweek Kraftwerk party in fashionable Bethnal Green to coincide with the group's shows. Tonight was born out of a frustration that myself personally, having stayed on the phone for nine hours and trying to get a ticket to see Kraftwerk perform live at the Tate. Uh, we felt we wanted to do a night that was exploring the music and the visuals. We just wanted to do something 
for those people, uh, including us, that didn't get tickets, basically. My boyfriend who's DJing right now, he, he DJs a lot of techno and a lot of minimal house and dance music, and I'm coming at Kraftwerk from a Kripe Rock angle. And so that was one of the things that we could connect about. I'm really into Detroit techno, so that's the kind of stuff that I play. And I kind of rediscovered Kraftwerk. They're used on a lot of um, influential tracks that people will find again and again, no matter how old they are or what sort of music they listen to. So they're constantly going to be rediscovered. And they still feel new, even though they've been around for 40 years. The difficulty of getting Kraftwerk tickets pales in comparison with the difficulty of getting close to the band. Regarding themselves as simple workers in the sound factory, they rejected the cult of personality from day one and are mystified by the public's fascination with their private lives. They turned down all superstar collaborations, including an offer from Michael Jackson, and the greater their fame became, the further they withdrew from the public gaze, the impenetrable shroud of media silence only fueling the aura of mystique that surrounds them. Nobody knows this better than Peter Butcher, who has been Kraftwerk's favorite photographer since the late 1980s. As they themselves won't pose for photographs, he mainly photographs their robots. Bei Kraftwerk geht es nicht um die Person, es geht um das Werk. Und die Roboter, die ich fotografiert habe, sind quasi Stellvertreter für das Gesamtkunstwerk von Kraftwerk. They were careful enough never to put themselves in a position where they were being held prisoner by the media. They decided when they wanted the media to be their prisoner. They decided when they wanted to make the industry bow to them. It's a really important thing, especially in today's age of like everybody being on Twitter and Facebook and sharing like the every detail of their private life. If I went to the toilet two minutes ago and now I'm going to go wash my feet. Uh, I think I'll go eat some spaghetti next and maybe I'll go to the movies. As if that's really important, as if your life is really so important other people just need to know every move about it. When you look at the timeline of like people like Mozart and classical composers and all that, what's left of them is that, the music, their compositions, the things that they created and the rest is just trivial. Mm -hmm.